don't you? Second Peter in chapter 1, as uh, we just heard read to us, I was at a seminar years ago when and there were thousands of people that were assembled at this seminar and the, the leader of the seminar was giving counsel about how to know for sure that you're saved. He said that a young person had come to him and had said, I have doubts about my salvation. What should I do? And he told a story. He said, uh, told a story about a fellow who had doubts about his salvation. And he said, the fellow went out behind the barn and he knelt down and he repeated his prayer of confession to God and his prayer of trusting in Christ as his Savior. And, and then he said he drove a stake in the ground and, and like he put a date on the stake. And then he said, whenever, he said, whenever you doubt your salvation in the future, he said, you can go back behind the barn and you can find that stake and you can remember that prayer that you prayed. And uh, I wrote that into my notes, but that isn't in the Bible anywhere, actually. You just don't see that in the Bible. The Bible actually, it might be a fine thing to do. The Bible doesn't really specifically teach that. But if I were to say to you, what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach about how a person can have confidence that they're saved? What does the Bible teach? And where does the Bible teach that? You, we know the Bible says that you can know that you have eternal life. It says that in 1 John. It's one of the purpose statements in 1 John, that you, you can know that you have eternal life. You can know that you have eternal life. But having eternal life and knowing that you have eternal life are related, but they're not the same thing. A person can be saved and yet still lack confidence in their salvation. And so the, the real question there would be, how does a person know they're saved? Or maybe a better question was, what does the Bible say about how a person can know they're saved? And an even better question is, what does the Bible say and where does it say it? Where can I turn in my Bible to see what God says about how I can have confidence that I have eternal life? And you probably already guessed that one of the places you could turn would be to 2 Peter and chapter 1, because this is exactly what Peter is going to do in a, in a kind of a farewell address. Years ago, I was reading a book in the front yard by D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the esteemed D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. It was actually a lecture series put into a book that he did at Westminster Seminary in a famous lecture series on preachers and preaching. And, and almost every preacher in America has probably read that book or referred to it. It is a wonderful book on preaching. I was sitting in an Adirondack chair in my front yard on Apple Valley Drive one summer afternoon, and I was reading that book. And, and in his own inimitable British way, he said, a pastor should never refer to himself in the pulpit. And if you know me well, and you, you're sitting here, so you know me well enough to know I was undone when I read that. I stopped and looked up for my book, and I thought, I hope that's not true because I do use personal illustrations. And, of course, there's a danger in those, I readily admit. And D. Martin Lloyd-Jones would probably do turn over in his grave at them. But did you notice this morning when our sister was reading the text of Scripture that the author referred to himself? You notice that? Well, he didn't, of course, he didn't do it. He didn't overdo that. But he did refer to himself and and referred to himself in a kind of a farewell address kind of thing. So it has some gravitas, has some weight to it. And he, and he also referred to himself in such a way as he said, and this is what Jesus told me. Almost as if we should have remembered that incident. And if you read the Gospel of John and you got to the end where it has this gorgeous climax in these post-resurrection appearances with Peter involved, you would remember that Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die. And this is what Peter referred to. He referred to himself, of course, in a great and holy way under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He did refer to himself here. This is a powerful passage that we are dealing with. This is a beautiful piece of God's Word. It is unparalleled in the New Testament that what we see here, and, and the heart of it is how we can have great confidence that we are saved, how we can know. And let me give you a little uh, thumbnail sketch of this, and then, I, and then we're going to go teaching right through these few verses that we've set aside to study today. But how would a person know? Can I just say it this way? What does the Bible say 
about how a person can know that they're born again. Well, it would be fine to have your mother remind you of the time you prayed, but the Bible doesn't say that. I'm not going to say anything bad about your mother, but the Bible doesn't say that. My mother reminds me of the time I prayed. My father reminded me of the time I prayed to receive Christ. I have a personal memory of that, but my confidence of my salvation is not based on my memory or on my evaluation of my sincerity as a five-year-old boy. My confidence is based on a couple of things the Bible does talk about, and Peter talks about them here. One of them is the ability to observe Christ-like qualities in a person's life. In other words, you, you could say you walk like a duck, you quack like a duck. You could say they're evidence of the life of God in a person is often what the scriptures refer to when, when a person is seeking confidence that they're born again. What evidence is there that the life of God is in you? This is what John does in his epistles. He says the, a person will believe these things and then there'll be evidence of love and, and there will be, you know, uh, a resistance to sin. This is a thumbnail sketch there of some of the things in 1 John. In other words, the way 1 John deals with it, which is about this, about confidence and salvation, is it says, examine your life and see if the evidence of the life of God is in you. So that's one of the things we're going to see here that Peter's going to do. And then he's going to, he's going to, he's going to do something else, and it is in this self-referent chunk, you know, from verses, I think it's 12 to 15, it is 12 to 15. In that, he's going to say, take your Bible and go back to the passages that you believe and remind yourself of them. Let me stir you up by reminding you of these things. And then and he says, and after I die, you'll always remember I said this. And this is essentially a paraphrase of what he said. Now, let's just see what I said. See if this is not true. And in, in a way that I have uh, arranged my, the way I've planned to talk to you today, there are four observations that I want to make that I think will be helpful to you. Here's the first one. If you're growing in godliness, you will have evidence of the life of God in you. I'm going to back up to verse 8. And show you this. Backing up to verse 8, if you're growing in godliness, which is the thing that we're, in, this is the imperative here, so we're told to do, add to your faith, diligently add to your faith, make every effort to add to your faith. In other words, grow in godliness. If you're growing in godliness, you'll have evidence of the life of God in you. And you remember the text from last week that it has this list in it, add to your faith virtue, or supplement your faith with virtue, Virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. In other words, add to your faith, supplement your faith, and be diligent to do this. Continue to grow, is what he's saying. In other words, if you're growing in godliness, adding your faith, you will have the evidence of the life. You have growing evidence of the life of God in you. Where there is life, there is growth. Where there is growth, there is life. There is fruitfulness. There is effectiveness. This is what he's going to say now. In, and he reaches the end of that uh, little section, verses 5 through 7. Notice in verse 8, and this kind of goes together. For if these qualities, or if these, in the original, it's like these, if these, this would be the list, if you will, the supplements, if these supplements are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You could do a little self-examination. You could say, what fruit is there in my life? What effectiveness is there in my life? Don't be too hard on yourself, but just ask, what fruit, who believes because I believe, who's encouraged because I have encouraged them, have been an example to them? A, a Christian leader asked me once about the ministry of Tom Harmon. Some of you know Tom Harmon's a friend of mine. He's an itinerant preacher, powerful use of the Lord in our state here. This national leader said, should I use, I suggested he use Tom Harmon as a speaker. And he said, why? He said, why should I use him? What is it about him that makes you think that he would be a useful speaker? And I hadn't given a lot of thought, but it's off the top of my head. I said, when I hear him preach, and particularly to men, which is when I normally heard him preach to men in men's conferences, he preaches the word. He's just saturated with the word. The word memorizes the word. His messages are saturated with the word. And his own personal testimony of pursuing God in his own life. And he would even give, Tom would often even give simple, earthy 
illustrations of things like what he was doing in order to try to grow in the Lord. And this, these testimonies, coupled with the testimony of Scripture and his personal testimony, made him very powerful. Peter is saying, if you know the Lord, the, you'll have the life of God in you, and you won't be unfruitful, and you won't be ineffective. There'll be some fruit as a result of that. There'll be some, there, it'll be, you'll be able to tell a person's a Christian because they will do Christian things. And there'll be evidence of growing in Christian things, uh, fruitfulness. Now, that's the first observation. If you're growing in godliness, then you'll have evidence of the life of God in you. And again, for these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 9 is the second observation. If you're not growing in godliness, you should ask yourself, is the life of God in me? If there's no evidence, there's no fruit or effectiveness, no growth in godliness, no desire to chase hard after God, pursue God, grow in the Lord, you should ask yourself, am I genuinely saved? Now, look at verse 9. Um, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. I think Peter's referring to a believer who's not living effectively, but it would be, be, be true of an unbeliever that he would have no evidence of fruitfulness or faithfulness or uh, influence for the Lord. If you're not growing in God, then you should ask yourself, do I have a life of God in me? If you look, he's saying, if you look like an unbeliever and you act like an unbeliever, you may even feel like an unbeliever. You do want to entertain the question, am I an unbeliever? Do I have a life of God in me? COVID has swept a terrible plague. It swept our, our world. People have died. No denying it. Um, people that we know and love have died. Uh, prematurely, and, and so it's a, it's a genuine problem. And even though we arm wrestle about the fix or how bad it is or whatever, even, you know, Christians don't fully agree. We, we, we realize we all can name people who have perished that we love. And that's obviously when you have a plague that would affect people's public assembly, and it's affected the public assembly all over the world, all over America, in every church. It's, and, and, and well, it, sh it should. That's why we have accommodated people who've watched online. Maybe you've done that. Uh, and and for, for safety, and you feel safe now. Some of our finest and most godly people um, who love the Lord deeply are uh, being very careful because of health things. We understand that. The elders understand that. Of course, the Lord understands that. And yet, here's what every Christian pastor I know has observed. This COVID thing has displayed something about the church that's not necessarily good. It's shown a lack of faithfulness with some people. Uh, kind of an interest in ease and easy choices. And it, there's much, many, many people have stepped up and shown their faithfulness and fidelity to God. And they have stepped up and shown the genuineness of their faith. But good pastors who, who love the Lord and elders that are evaluating the faith, character, and virtue of people and wondering, do I have an unbeliever here, a believer here? How do I help this person grow? Good Christian leaders have legitimately, they have legitimate concerns about, well, who's really saved here? Who really knows the Lord? It would be a good question to ask. The scriptures frequently tell us to examine ourselves. But that's not the point of this text. This point is to tell, of this text is to tell us how we can have confidence that we do know the Lord. So let me just hasten on to my third point. Number one, if you're growing in godliness, you'll have evidence of the life of God in you. Number two, if you're exerting yourself to grow in godliness, you, if you're not exerting yourself to grow in godliness, you should ask, am I, am I a believer? Am I really genuinely saved? We're just kind of enculturated to some Christian experience. And third, if you, but you, but the scriptures are teaching here, and this is the positive thrust of it, this is what Peter's primarily getting at. You can grow in godliness. You can. You can add quality to quality. You can add to your faith. You can supplement your faith. You can grow. You, 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 uh, you can have the experience of the qualities that are listed in measure in verses 5 through 7. That's what he's saying, and that's very encouraging. You go back to 5, and you see this key phrase there. In the NIV, it's consistent the way they translate it 
in each of the places it occurs. And I think in the NIV, it says, make every effort. Once in the ESV that I'm preaching from, it says, make every effort. But it changes the phrase in verse 7 and says, be all the more diligent. But it's the same phrase in the original. It's kind of that, and maybe we could use the placeholder, make every effort, make every effort. And later in the last section, when Peter is talking about what he's doing to, to remind them of the word, he kind of uses wordplay, and he says, I'm making every effort to do that. And so it kind of rings in our ears. And it'll be something that we should think about. There's an effort required to, to, to grow in the Lord. Personal grow, growth in the Lord requires personal effort, strenuous personal effort. The New Testament teaches that growth in grace requires strenuous personal effort. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise or call you a legalist. This is what the New Testament teaches. This is what he's teaching here. Paul, in another place, in 1 Timothy, he says, exercise yourself to godliness. Discipline yourself like you would do when you were working out. I was in a half marathon years ago, and the night before we were going to run the half marathon, it was the one I told you about last week with my runner pastor friend who's a lot leaner and a lot faster and a lot more athletic than I he was running in that. He was going to finish a long time ahead of me, and he did. And we were having pizza <laughs> the night before. And one of my daughters says to me, now you know a little bit about why my times were not as fast as his. We're having pizza the night before. One of my daughters says to me, hey, Dad, what if you beat Dan Cummings tomorrow? And I said, Hannah, I would be more likely to win Miss America. I'm not going to beat Dan Cummings tomorrow. You know why? Because I, well, first of all, he's gifted, and I'm not, and, I, and I'm a Clydesdale, and he's not, and I haven't, hear me, I haven't, hear me, I haven't done the miles. you got to do the miles. There's no shortcut. you got to do the miles. If you know anything about the human body and, and the interval training and distance running, uh, endurance, sport, you've got to do the miles. You've got to do the reps. If you don't remember anything else, I think this is the thing I'd like you to get and see that this is what Peter is saying is you want to grow, you've got to do the miles. You have to discipline yourself and add to your faith virtue. And supplement. It's going to require diligent effort. Now, now hear me. Hear me now. If you were to say, I can grow in godliness, all I need is diligent personal effort, then I will call you in error. I will call you a legalist. That's a dangerous kind of legalism. Why? Because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God is going to initiate, is going to stimulate godliness, and it's going to initiate those things, that God in the power of the Holy Spirit is going to empower that. But he also is still going to say it still requires diligent personal effort. If you want to be godly, you've got to try hard to be godly. But you're going to realize that that instinct came from the Lord and the power came from the Lord. Does it make sense? To say that you can do this on your own is folly and ignorance. It's not biblical and it's legalistic and it's a dangerous kind of legalism. It's wrong. But to say that you can kind of pietistically, quietistically kind of let go, let God be godly without any personal effort is not what the Bible teaches. And this is what Paul is saying. You can add these qualities to one another and make every effort to do that. Show, in the ESV, show diligence. Get at it. Do the miles. And that's what he's saying. 1 Timothy 4, 7-8, through 8, to quote Paul, who often must have watched running or participated in it, have nothing to do, he says in 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, have nothing to do with the irreverent, silly myths, but rather... Train yourself for godliness. Do the miles. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, and it holds a promise for the present life and for the life that is to come. And so now, remember that if you think you can become godly without the Spirit's self, it's a form of legalism, but you cannot grow unless you discipline yourself. And, but you can grow. Peter is saying you can grow. Even in an atmosphere of suffering, 1 Peter, and even in an atmosphere of infidelity or doctrinal error when others who, uh, us, around us are deconstructing their faith or others around us are falling away and others around us are doubting the things that they once believed, this was the atmosphere that Peter's writing to in 2 Peter. And he's saying in this time of apostasy, you do not have to join that time of that apostasy, but you can, you do not have to join them in their apostasy. You can walk with God. Now, 
question I have, when you look at this in verse 10, it says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling election. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You will never fall. Does it seem to you like the Bible teaches that Christians are going to, once you get saved, you're never going to ever sin again? Would that be consistent with what the scriptures teach? Uh, I feel to John in his epistle, my little children, I write to you that you don't sin. My best advice to you is don't sin. And then you're like, okay. And then what's the next question? But what if I do? But what if I slip? You know how hard my life is. Sometimes I slip. Then the next phrase is, but if any man sin or any woman, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation, the go-between between God and us to absorb his wrath. And not only for our sin, but anybody who gets saved. First John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, etc. No, the Bible doesn't teach that we won't ever stumble. But the Bible does teach that we not ultimately fall. What does fall mean is the question here. That's, that's what I would flag as I go through this text. I'm like, what does fall mean? What does he mean by fall? Now, the fall can mean one of two things. It, it, can I use these phrases? We often use them. It can mean backsliding or it can mean apostasy. They're two different things. The Bible teaches the possibility of backsliding. And the Bible teaches the possibility of apostasy. They're similar, but they're different. In both cases, the backslider and the apostate don't look saved. At least that you give them a time that like their misbehavior makes them look like they're not saved. The backslider is saved, but he's strayed from obedience. The apostate never was saved. It could mean backsliding or stumbling, which is what the word actually means, stumbling. It'd be like you're running a race and you stumble, but you finished may even win. Uh, Jesus says to them, in Mark 14, 27, in cherry picking a story of Jesus, all you all will, I'm sorry, this is Jesus to his disciples. And a moment later, I'll tell the story. Jesus says in Mark 14, 27, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Thus he says to his followers, to his disciples, you're all going to fall away. But we know that all of them did not ultimately, only one fell away and didn't come back. Only one was apostate, the others were acting as backsliders. All the disciples at that point were backsliders. Now that's encouraging. That's encouraging, kind of like they fell away, but they came back. Uh, so it's possible to fall away in the sense of backsliding. This would be a believer who's not, and, and the Bible talks about this, like for instance, in, in a book of Hebrews in, in chapter 12, Hebrews is a book that's written to those who some are backsliders and some are genuine Christians, some are backsliders and some are apostates. That aren't genuinely saved at all. We'll get to that. But in Romans, or Hebrews 12, he's referring to believers because he says they're children. And he says, my son, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons in Hebrews 12 and verse 5? My son, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure God is treating you as sons. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline in which all have participated, you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, verse 9, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. That's helpful. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Look in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone for, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The New Testament teaches that believers are going to progress in holiness. And if they don't, they're, then God is going to work on them like a good father and chastise them. So when you backslide or fall away, and there's a very real sense in all of us do that to some degree, he's faithful to the chastisement might be just a word in the ear, or might be something much more difficult. It might be something that you're enduring in your life that really is unfair, but he's using it 
to discipline you. It might be a financial reversal. It might be a business reversal. It might be a difficult family member. It might be something else that God uses. But you, you and your heart, if you're tender-hearted to God, you'll recognize God is working on you to, 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 so that you'll progress in faith so that he'll get you back from your backsliding, from your falling away. But this does not mean you're not saved. The backslider is saved, in other words. Now, that's what's described in, in Hebrews 12. 1 Corinthians 11 also describes this discipline that, that that is why many of you are weak and some of you have and ill and some of you have died. It's pretty dire, pretty serious. This is like Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit saying when people are believers and they, they backslide or fall away in disobedience and act like unbelievers, God may chastise them in order to bring holiness or he may bring them home. And the Bible's really plain about that. So later it says, judge yourself so that you won't be judged. And that's why I'm always real serious in my heart at communions. I'm always like, is there anything in my life, Lord? Because I won't let you take me home in discipline. And I fear you and love you. And, and so show me what's in my life so I can confess it, get it quickly under the blood. And that's what all of us should, should do because it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an of a God who's angry, as the Bible says. And so, so I ask, Romans 11 talked about this kind of stumbling in reference to Jewish, uh, to the nation of Israel. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? I'm talking about backsliding. It's like stumbling, but not falling, ultimately losing your salvation, which the Bible doesn't say you can do. First Corinthians 9, 24, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Uh, and then again in Jude 24, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So there is that fall might mean backsliding in this particular case. I think that's the main idea. But fall in the Bible may, may mean ultimately fall. And it may describe not a backslider, but an apostate. Um, passages of scriptures, so the scriptures teach that salvation is a work of God, at one time work of God, and we're given, when we believe, we're given eternal life that is eternal when we get it. So it wouldn't be eternal life could it, if it was taken away. The nature of salvation itself would be an argument that the scriptures teach that a person who genuinely is saved will never not be saved, but will persevere. But then there are passages of scripture that seem to, that look like a person could fall away from faith. What are those passages? Those are describing the apostate. Am I making any sense? I hope I'm making this clear. Those are describing a person who never was saved, though he was initially included, maybe even a member. Maybe he's like taking Christianity for test drive but he doesn't own it yet, uh, to use a weak illustration. 1 John 2 and 19, John says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. That's the perseverance of the saints. But they went out that it might become plain they were not of us. On the other side, listen to what Jesus says in John 8, 28 and 29. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Those who are genuinely saved are eternally secure, and they will persevere. And then if you want more on this, just study every passage in the Bible about salvation and the nature of salvation. The nature of salvation is, is a gift and a work, a miraculous work of God in us. And if you want more proof, just take your Bible and read Romans in chapter 8 thoroughly. It's like Paul is trying to think of every possible way that he can say nothing, nothing in heaven and on earth, in the spirit realm, in a human fused physical realm, nothing will what? Nothing will separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ. It is not in, located in my faithfulness. It's located in his faithfulness. It's not located in your righteousness. It's located in his righteousness. Yet that's not to say that there won't be a desire to pursue righteous living. And so the apostate then is warned in, in Hebrews 6, and I think the Hebrews 6 
four to six passages aimed at the apostate, the one test driving the faith that hasn't bought in. It is impossible. This is a, this is a Hebrews 6, four to six. It is impossible in the case of those who have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gifts, shared the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and have fallen away to restore them again to repentance. Since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him to, up to contempt. I think in the story of Jesus in Luke 8, 13, the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive with joy, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. That's the kind of falling away that I think is describing the apostate. So I give a warning to the backslider or the apostate. Let me speak to you if you find that you're lacking these qualities. Be warned. This is dangerous. We don't know about you right now, whether you're saved or unsaved. We don't have a tester. Only God knows. Take this seriously. This is what Hebrews 10 says. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. These texts are often avoided in the modern church. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the very Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord judges his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So there's some serious warnings here. But yet, you know, I kind of move on because the heart of the text is to encourage us how we can have confidence. How you can, you don't have to worry about whether you're a backslider or apostate because you have growing evidence of the life of God in you. That's what the heart of the text is. So where do you put your efforts? Here's what I've noticed. Backsliders and apostates tend to put their efforts in justifying their behavior, not in seeking God. They put their efforts in making themselves look better than people. And then, you know, they find Christians who are inconsistent and they point out their inconsistencies and it's not hard to do. And they talk about those things all the time. And they put a lot of effort into, I'm a victim. I mean, here's why I sin. I mean, you would sin too if you had to go through what I went through. And yet they're far from God and they're, and they're in danger of the judgment of God and they have no confidence that they have eternal life. We probably all know somebody that we love very much that's right in this place. And their efforts, their diligent efforts are expended on pointing out the failures of other people. Or the diligent efforts are expended on pointing out the exigent circumstances that they have that make it especially hard for them to obey. When the Bible says, just give all diligence to going hard after God, that would be the answer. Just go hard after God. Do the miles. Add to faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge self-control and so, so forth. Concentrate on the power of God, which is talks about early in the text. The promises of God, which it talks about early in the text. And the supplements that come by the power of God through the promises of God. And do the miles, and you don't have to worry about whether you're a backslider or apostate because we don't have a tester for that. And by the way, before we move on, and I know I've spent some time on this, and I did that on purpose. What should we, how should, what should we do for those who are backsliders or apostate and we just don't know which they are well we should bring them back we should the church should aim itself on bringing people back to god listen to james 5 19 and 20 my brothers if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sin Think how sin leads to sin and multiplies into sinful effects on other people. When one person sins, their children are harmed, their loved ones are harmed, the whole world is different. But if you are able to save somebody and bring them back from that, then think of all the sin that doesn't happen and all the heartache that doesn't happen. Try to rescue people. Pray for them. The Bible says we should restore them. And this is Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone's caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness and keep a watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. And the Bible says that we should gently and patiently teach people and try to guide the truth around the mental obstacles that they have and the excuses that they have. Listen to 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents 
with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after having been captured by him to do his will. Around us are many who we deeply love who are in the snare of the devil, and they need to be graciously, carefully, gently taught and recovered. This is, this is why we teach Sunday school. This is why we take our Sunday school teaching seriously. This is why we learn gospel conversation. Because there are souls that are precious. And if you think about that, you might have a loved one that won't listen to you. And, they, and you've said everything to them. And you, want, you know what to tell them, but they won't listen. But what if you were to pray and God were to send somebody into their life they admired Something that they looked up to, something that they really thought a lot of. And what if God gave their heart to that person and that person was faithful and diligent and gentle and careful and, 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 they, and they saw something and heard something that they wouldn't have seen or heard otherwise. This is what, this is the, this should motivate us as a church. Like there are backsliders and apostates out there and our, our ministry should be to try to help them. Now, I'm going to return here to the text as I've, that kind of exerts us about backslider apostate. I feel like our church needed to hear that right now. But let's go back on that now here, and we're picking back up in verse 10. And let me get back to the heart and the emphasis that I think is sweeter. And, and, it, and you know, we, we had to have some warning there, but now let's move away from that. And let's be encouraged by this. You can have confidence. You do not have to fall. Look at verse 10. That's what it says. Be del more diligent to confirm your calling or election. In other words, do the miles <laughs> to confirm you're genuinely a believer. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. You don't ever need to fall. You don't need to fall. You have this, you have this confidence. Strength for today, the song says, and great is thy faithfulness and bright hope for tomorrow. We have the strength that we need not to fall. You don't have to fall. Make excuse for yourself. Stop your sin. Stop your love. Stop your anger. Stop your greed. Stop talking about people behind their back. Stop that. Repent of that. Turn from that. Add to your faith virtue. You don't have to live that way. And the second thing in verse 11, you will, this is sweet. This is the, this is a, a very, very sweet spot. There's so many here in this text, but this is a very sweet spot. Verse 11 teaches you can have a great reward in heaven someday. In this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You, have, you can have confidence. You can have confidence that you will see the Lord in his kingdom someday. As you grow in these qualities, it will give you, I won't save you. You're saved by grace through faith. But the confidence that you get that you have eternal life comes when you grow in the Lord, and some people don't have confidence because they haven't grown for years, and they've squandered the, the things that God has given them to grow, but they haven't admitted their need and had ambition to grow. I went through my journals this week a lot. I read through old journals. I've journaled for years and years and years, and one thing I noticed is that there's a lot of holy ambition in them, a lot of things. Oh, Lord, please do this in my life. Lord, please do this in my life. And I remember writing those things and thinking, I don't know if that will happen. I don't know if that will happen. But I know I need that to happen. And sometimes it's a jagged graph, right? But, but what's so sweet, and Lois, I read, you know, you, uh, you were there when I read you a part this week. Some of those prayer requests were answered in a smaller scale than I prayed, but they were answered. And some of them were answered in ways that were beyond what I could have imagined. Am I right? Just beyond what God, what, like only God could do that. We, when we strenuously aspire to grow in godliness, God will inspire that and God will empower that and God will do what you can't do. He can jet you forward. Don't be discouraged. You know, it's not all up to you, but you should apply yourself to diligent efforts. You should aspire in your journal or however you do it. You should, here it comes, do the miles. You've got to do the miles. But think about this. There's a bright hope for tomorrow. There's a happy homecoming. Let me look forward to it. I went to college and my parents moved. But I found them. I found where they lived. They didn't tell me where they lived, but I, I called around. No, I'm kidding. They, they gave me the address. 
I'll never forget that homecoming that year from college. I have two little brothers that they're little, they don't know better. They look up to me and like me and love me. And they're seven and 10 years younger, so it's kind of perfect. Had a family dog, nice mom and dad, Christian people. I'm away at college. I'm the oldest son. They think I'm making good because they don't know everything. Um, and so now I'm coming home, coming home for the summer. I'll never forget driving my car into that strange park driveway. And there were the people that I loved most in the world, my mom and dad, waiting for my little brothers come running out. The dog, my mom fixed my favorite meal that night. And we all sat around and laughed, and they listened to my every word, all my stories from college, and listened to what I had to say. That was my love language, you know. And so they listened, and I told them stories, and they fed me my favorite meal, and they brought me my favorite cake. And then we had what we always do. We went out, we played football in the yard, and I was really good because my brothers are seven and ten years younger than me. So that was a lot of fun. It's not the same now, but it was. My grandkids can beat me now, but... But I remember how sweet that night was, that summer night with the people I loved so much. And we played our football game, and then we played with the dog until the dusk overcame the day. And, <laughs> and we went inside, and we sat around and told stories late into the night. What a homecoming it was. I went up to my bedroom, which I'd never seen before. And my dad and my mom, they had made a special room just for me. And it was my quilt on the bed, my stereo, and my records on the stereo, and my clothes in the closet, and my stuff, and my dresser. And it was a place prepared just for me. And it's quite a homecoming. I've always remembered that. Peter says, keep doing the miles. And you can have confidence in a homecoming someday. He says it's so much better. He uses the full name of Jesus Christ and appeals to the kingdom. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can have confidence that you'll be a part of that kingdom. There's an old song. I thought about singing it to you, but it changed my mind. There's an old song they used to sing called, I dreamed I searched heaven for you. And it, it's, a, it's a ballad about a person that goes to heaven and worships God then starts looking around for their kids, for their loved ones. And in the, in the sad song, they search and they search and then they don't find their loved one. I dreamed I searched heaven for you, but I couldn't find you there. I think it would be good if we not only had confidence that we have eternal life, but we were able to help our loved ones have confidence that we have eternal life. You should help the people that love you know they don't have to worry about your soul, make up stories at your funeral, but that you knew the Lord because the life of God was in you. And how does that work? Well, you got to be saved and then do the miles. Discipline yourself. Be diligent. Now, this piece about Paul, he says, he says something that reminds me of my grandmother Shipley. She's been with the Lord for years. My grandpa used to visit her house and the little house, the little greenhouse on Otten Road and and she, I would say, oh, Grandma, I'm sorry, I, I should have been by before, got busy. Grandma would sometimes gently smile at me and say, well, I'm not going to be here forever, you know. Someday I won't be here. And you know what I always think when I drive by that house now? That, yep, she was right. She's gone, been gone for a long time. Wish I could stop in and smell the coffee and have her tell me things I didn't have the sense to ask her. Peter says... Here's something you need to know. I'm serious. I'm not going to be here forever. Jesus said, I'm about, to, I'm about to take off this tent. Let's just hear how he says it. Therefore, I intend to always remind you of these qualities. The list. Though now you know them, and you're established in the truth that you have. I know you know this, he says. I think it's right, as long as I'm in this body, and the literal Greek is in this tent, he says, to stir up your, stir you up by way of reminder, because I know the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus made clear to me. And all the church fathers, scriptures don't say, but all the church fathers say, Peter was crucified under Nero. Shortly after this, he was crucified, crucified. 
One of the church fathers says that, that he refused to be crucified like Jesus because he denied the Lord, so he was crucified upside down. But all the church fathers say he's crucified. He says, someday I'm going to put off this tent, so I'm going to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know the putting up of my body will be soon. As our Lord Jesus made clear to me, you can see that in John 20 there, and I will make every effort, he says, so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. I don't want you ever to forget this. This is what we say to our loved ones. The last beat of my heart, I will say, I love you, follow Jesus. The last breath I have, I will say, I love you, follow Jesus. <laughs> so we have a reason to do what we do because there are people who are not following Jesus and don't have eternal life. And these people sometimes have our name and we love them. And we should expend every effort to keep growing so they see that, and, the, and this is the fourth thing. If you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll review. It won't take long. Number one, if you're growing in godliness, you'll have evidence of the life of God. If you're not growing in godliness, you should ask, do you know God? You can grow in godliness. And, and number four, and it took me a while to get to it, but here, here it is, to finish faithful and help others finish faithful, remind each other. Point out the scriptures to them, to, to each other. That's what he's saying. Never stop growing. Work hard, grow Never stop growing. And when you fall, get up, go again. Make every, he says, I'm going to make every effort to tell you this. And he says, my departure, he uses that euphemism for death, calls death departure for a Christian. It really is. For all of us, it's the death is departure. You depart to judgment or you depart to arrive in heaven. Imagine that. His departure and, a revi- uh, and a arrival. What would, that, what would this look like in your life? Hey, we hear stories about people falling away. Maybe we all fall away. There's that older guy who kind of gets cynical, and he gives up. He's, his church attendance, his body are absent. He's seen too many painful things in his life. He's, he's cynical and doubtful now. He needs to go back, and, and he needs to repent of his hard heart, and he needs to start seeing a few sunrises and sunsets, thankful for his children, his wife, come back to church do the miles. The young dad who feels sorry for himself because his wife doesn't treat him the way he feels like he should be treated and so there's that porn thing or there's that flirtation thing and, and he knows that he's falling away. He's sitting in church. He's got his Bible like usual but he knows he's falling away and that man would have tearful repentance to God and he'd maybe get a friend and tell all to a friend so that he could do the miles of following and add to his faith virtue. Or maybe there's that young mom who struggles at night when she remembers her angry words at her husband or her kids. And she needs to realize that God is in the business of helping people change when they sin. And that God can do what no man can do. And she maybe needs to have tea with an older godly woman who's had that same battle talk about that and start again do the miles or maybe there's that teen girl that needs to get up early and turn on that lamp in the little corner of her room so she doesn't wake up other people and before she goes off to face the world read her bible and talk to god and thank him and devote herself to god even though all the other girls at school so very few of them do she could get up and she could do the miles by turning on that little lamp and letting it fall out her pages and praying to god just a simple prayer every morning and giving herself to God, and God would powerfully work in her life, miraculously and powerfully work in her life. There was a pastor who fell away, a Christian leader who fell away. It's always sad when Christian leaders fall away. This guy had every privilege. He, he really was privileged, and he's well-known, and he was well-connected. But he, he got afraid, and he denied God and Jesus, and when people challenged him, he even used salty language so that when people would know that he wasn't a follower of Jesus. It, wasn't, it was sad. It was a dark scandal. He cursed to emphasize his point. Was he, a, was he a backslider or was he an apostate? Well, he wasn't an apostate because he wrote this book. It was Peter, that who fell away, who backslid, who fell away, and Jesus 
recovered him. You remember that sweet scene where he makes him breakfast up in Galilee and they have fish and he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, tend my lambs, come back, get on the team. And he does. And, and he finishes faithful. He, he's faithful to God after he so denied the Lord. He now is faithful to God. You can fail and you can recover. That's the guy who wrote the book did that. How sweet is it that? But this is true. And so he asked forgiveness. Truly, truly, John 21, 18 and 19, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk. Jesus talking to Peter, walk wherever you wanted. When you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after that, he said, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. And Jesus is saying, you hear him? He's saying it to you, follow me and do the miles. There'll be a great reward in that. We're going to have a family meeting.